Okay, we should get started. We'll do a recap first and then go to new material. We'll start with a prayer. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and minds again, we pray, that we might understand your word. Help us as we look at these verses from Mark, what it says to us, and how it might change and transform our hearts moving forward. So send your spirit upon us, open our hearts and eyes to you. We ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. Last week we looked at chapter 9, verses 1 to 13. There are four pages of review. I don't want to go through all four, but just I've chosen a few, probably too many, but... Number one, it's always a good place to start, is number one. It's interesting to me that Mark's account is much more detailed than that in Matthew and Luke. Matthew, 153 words, Luke, 142. Mark totals 326. And the question I have, and maybe you've asked it too, is why is this incident so important to Mark and Peter, I suggest, to record in such detail, in more detail than it was for Matthew and Luke. Um, number four gives something that's unique: the sheer powerless of the powerlessness, excuse me, of the disciples in this way is not found elsewhere in the Gospels. This is interesting how they could not do this. Um, <laughs> we are running into scribes. Number seven reminds us, and probably what they're asking for. Number eight is by what authority you're doing this? By what authority? Yes, I'm sure they kind of gave it to the disciples because they couldn't heal the boy, but uh, by what authority seems to be the question they're always going to ask. Number 10 makes a note that this is the only instance when the respectful salutation of Jesus, presumably the peace be with you by the multitude is reported. Don't know why, but that's an interesting point. Number 11 adds, there's an expectation. You know, I brought my, my, my son to, your, to you to heal, and your disciples couldn't do it. The expectation is that they should have been able to do it. And uh, no. Number 13, some people try to say this is epilepsy. The suggestion is made that it's something more than epilepsy. It is a demonic position because notice the interesting things that this does to him and the timing it does to him. When he's brought to Jesus, a terrible fit occurs. And when Jesus is going to cast the spirit out, another terrible fit occurs. And I think that's significant to know. Uh, <laughs> number 15, if you can. That's from chapter 9, verse 22. It appears to me that this uh, fellow... His confidence in Jesus able to do this is being weakened because the disciples were unable to do anything. Um, number 16, we talked about before about Mark's emphasis on emotion, much more than Matthew, Luke, or John. And here's another example of that. It's almost a cry of exasperation uh, about their lack of faith, their hardness of heart. 17 points out some extra places you can look at the hardness of heart. Uh, and 18 points out the use of unbelieving generation. How long? That's an interesting question. How long must I put up with you? Not even be with you, but must put up with you. And Jesus is going to take care of the important activity. Uh, 20 emphasizes Jesus' patience. He continues to instruct the 12 and prepare them for the work they have to do. And uh, 21 tries to point out the violence that the seizure of the boy experiences when he's brought to Jesus seems to fit with this is more than just epilepsy or something like that. Uh, what was the next one? Oh, no, no. 28, the expression that Jesus says is amazing. Come out of him and never enter him again. I believe this is unique in Jesus' activity. The part of never enter him again, that part is added here. So can you imagine a father who has dealt with this with his child his whole life and hearing come out of him, seeing that happen and having heard Jesus then 
never enter him again would be a great, a wonderful, a wonderful addition to that. Uh, to the, to the, 30 points out that uh, verses 28 to 29 kind of are an epilogue to the event, and uh, 31 points out the differences. Actually, 31 and 32 point out differences in Luke has nothing of this. Matthew's is quite a bit longer, and what it emphasizes is the lack of faith. And there's an interesting point um, when Jesus says in verse 29 in our text, this can come out by nothing but prayer. Uh, that section is not in Matthew's, but there is a, a footnote in your biblical text, and some manuscripts have, in this is in Matthew's gospel, However, this kind, kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. So it's interesting that that is in some texts, but not in all. I don't know what that means, I guess, but I'm just pointing out a unique point. And so then comes the second major prophecy of the Passion. There are some differences in this, and the trouble the disciples seem to have is that Jesus is going to be sacrificed. You can look at the differences of this one from others. Uh, 37, statement number 37, points out two key points about Jesus in Galilee. He desires to instruct his disciples without interruption. Of course, he's going to be interrupted, but he's instructing them now. That's the portion here. And number two, he must go to Jerusalem where his mission will be fulfilled. And so his eye is sent toward for Jerusalem. And I think I put in a couple of them, like number 41, uh, says that the, they, that's the disciples, still don't get it. They don't understand Jesus. They don't understand what he's talking about. And I think that's why it's so important for Jesus to do this, this mission, this emphasis of teaching his disciples, because they don't get it. And they need to get it, because they definitely need to get this. So that's a quick overview. Why do you think they didn't get it? Because it was so unique and so different? Because it is so different from what they expected. Experienced? What Jesus is, is not what they expected at all. Okay. And uh, the whole concept of a servant suffering is very different. It's not what they saw. It's not what they expected at all. Hmm. I don't know. Would you have expected this? It's pretty different. And it's not what anyone at that point apparently is expecting. Going on. So we ended with what section? We ended with Jesus talking about what it means for him to be the Messiah, right? And that's important to, to remember Sorry, let me do that. Okay, chapter nine. Too many pages here. Okay, here we go. Just let me read that section again from verse 30 to 32. They left that place and made their way through Galilee, but he did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed in the hands of men. They will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement. They were afraid to ask him. So what did they do? What's the proper response? Anytime Jesus is talking about uh, his mission, there is misunderstanding. And what type of misunderstanding comes next? In 33 to 37, what are they talking about? What are Jesus' disciples talking about as Jesus has been talking about suffering and dying, being sacrificed? What are they talking about? Who's the greatest? Isn't that interesting? But do you think it's because they have no concept of the whole picture in terms of what Jesus was trying to do? And they have no concept. They did not understand who Jesus is. That's one reason right. he's trying to teach them. But it's fascinating to me that each time he clearly states what's going to happen, they go off in an entirely different direction. It's like, we don't even want to talk about it. I mean, it just ended with saying, uh, but they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. 
So sometimes if you don't understand that and you're afraid of something, go to something entirely different, I guess, right? That's what they did. They went to something entirely I don't different. Think we would in this day and age. And so now we come then to the recurring argument. A recurring yeah. argument. Who is the greatest? We're in verse 33. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them. Notice Jesus is in the house. He's instructing his disciples. The teaching will start here. We'll go all the way through verse 50. Um, the, if you read in various commentators, they will emphasize interesting points about why these sections are together. And they talk about the words coming together. I'm not sure that's that important. But Jesus' intention of asking the question, what were you arguing about on the way, is to provide the teaching and to get them beyond, I think, what they're talking about. Arguing about uh, dialogizomai, to consider, to argue, is what they were doing with the, with the scribes before as well. So arguing about, having a discussion, more than a discussion, I'm the most important. No, I am. Why is that so important? I guess it is to a lot of people, huh? But they were silent. <laughs> what do you say to Jesus? What do you say to him if that's what you've been talking about? And just before that, he's talking about suffering and dying. They were silent because they were, they were, they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. Wow. It's an adjective, mega, megas. Mega, we use mega in English, I guess, right? Greater in size or importance and degree. So who is the greatest one? And so Jesus sits down to teach them. He called the 12 to him. Uh, interesting word, poneo, to send out to order. So it's more than just a request, but it's kind of you all come here. And so he says, if anyone wants to be first, he must be last and servant of all. He took a child, had him stand among them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes this little child such as this in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but him who sent me. So what's Jesus trying to do? He's trying to change their attention, change their importance, from looking at self toward others, the emphasis of service, the one to be last, not first, last. Uh, the child is a pedion, pedion, a young child. Uh, what's the what is the place of a young child in that culture? Not, not to be heard. Yeah, not much. They're probably just kind of almost not seen right. at all, right? Mm -hmm. Totally unimportant. Whoever, if you want to be first, you must be like this child. It's not the place of importance to be first among all people. And I think the disciples are going to have trouble with that. Uh, Here they are. When I was in, I guess it was high school, we had a youth minister who was good with music. Jay Musfeld was his name. He was excellent. He wrote, uh, we did the, whoever wants to be great among you must be a servant, and whoever wishes to be first must be last of all. There was a song he made of that. So I always remember that statement. And in the world, what happens in their culture, it's important to be the, it's important to be the most important person because that's what people seem to think is important as well. In chapter 8, Verses 34 and 35, we see kind of that point as well. Calling the crowd along with his disciples, Jesus said to them, if anyone wants to follow after me, do you remember what you're supposed to do? Take yourself, take up your, I'm sorry, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me in the gospel will save it. Take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. Kind of the same phrase, different words entirely, but the same emphasis. If you want to be first, if you want to be the most important, it happens as you become last, the least of all, the servant of all. Diakonos, 
that we get the word deacon from that, a person who serves, or we get deaconess from that same root word, a person working in the service of another, not someone who's first, but the person who's behind and off. That's the person that he calls the disciples to be, to leave behind the need to be most important, number one, and all of that, instead to become servants. How hard is that to be? Is it hard for the disciples to do that? Is it hard for people to do that in general? It's hard for people to give up that importance. Another place you'll read this. This is from chapter 10, verses 42 to 45. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions act as tyrants over them. Not so among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you will be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you will be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's chapter 10, verse 42 and 45. So Jesus returns again and again to that theme, trying to help his disciples see this, that they need to change, they need to change their attitude. Judy. But, but then they did get that after his death and Pentecost and that they gave their lives. Yes. But I think, I think right now we're seeing that it's still a process. Yeah. This is the time of teaching. This is the time. And they still don't ultimately get it until, like you say, after he rises again, after they see, you know, after they put their fingers in, the, in his hands and in his side, uh, because that's what Jesus told them to do. I know we get Thomas in there, you know, doubting Thomas or disbelieving Thomas, but he did believe. And then after Pentecost, that was the final, ultimate change that we see in them, being able and willing to stand up front and to say these things. Um, I was reading, it was interesting. I'd never thought of it this way. Verses 36 and 37, uh, one of the authors I read by the name of Lane says, this is an enacted parable. I'd never heard of an enacted parable, but his emphasis is that the disciples are to identify themselves with children and become the little ones who have no basis for thoughts or desires of greatness. Become like a child. Become like a child because not a childlike faith, but a child who trusts in, well, a child trusts completely and totally, don't they? And that's what we need to become like. Not to be the person who is served, but the one who is the lowest, the one who serves. And if you welcome such a child in his name, you welcome me, he says, and whoever welcomes me welcomes my Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. Emphasis on service, on being childlike, not childish. We have enough of childishness, but to be welcomed. And uh, the last phrase there, but him who sent me, the word him who sent is apostello. And remember, Jesus sent the twelve out as, what did he call them? He called them Apostles, right? And that's the word apostello, which is used here. But him who sent me, an apostello, an apostle, is one who is sent for another. Kind of like as an agent, I guess you would say at this point. So after there's Jesus makes a second passion prediction, we see again the total misunderstanding. They don't understand what he's talking about. Matter of fact, they're talking about almost the exact opposite about who's the greatest, who's the most important. And Jesus is trying to, as he's beginning to teach them, to help them see where they need to go, what type of people they need to become. Let me stop and pause before we go to the second part of this unit. Anybody else, thoughts, comments you wanna talk about? Yes, ma'am. So I know this is probably a dumb question, but they were arguing about who the greatest was among them. So I believe so. I think that's the emphasis. Who is the greatest? Yes. Which of us are greater than others? I mean, that's a continuing discussion yeah, the, the with them. Um, the I know people greatest, that do that. They're worried though. about who's the greatest yes. among them. Mm -hmm. That's what is yeah, blowing my mind a little bit. But that's, I mean, that's almost denial. So they can't accept what Jesus is trying yeah. to portray to them. So they revert to, you know, being 
They revert to what, basically what's part of their culture and who they are, right? I mean, when you go into a stressful situation, you go back to what you were like, unless you can somehow change that dramatically. And they're having trouble with that. And they're having a lot of trouble with that. But I think, I, I don't know, I don't, you know, I don't like to rag on the disciples, but I think, I, I've said many times, I'll say it again, that if I were there, I'd probably be the worst one. I wouldn't be Judas, or I wouldn't yeah, be Trey, so you, you know. But their humanness. I mean, I'm sorry? Like, clearly they're human, so oh, definitely. part of that. Um, you know, and that, that really sets up, sets up for how this is not a made-up, you know, story type thing, because if you're gonna if you're gonna make a story, if you're gonna make yourselves sound better, especially if these guys think, you know, whoever's greatest, but they really come off as the exact opposite. And I think that humanness is what's helpful for us, because then we can go then, well, if God can use them, you know, God could use a person like me too. And I think that is important, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's interesting, you wonder who, because Peter, James, and John were the, the three who were the closest to Jesus. And Peter is the closest of the three. And so it'd be like Peter saying, well, guys, you know, it's me. I mean, <laughs> That, that's humanity. I mean, and Peter is pretty upfront about all those things. I mean, he's pretty, I don't know. So, but, but it's fascinating to me that Jesus talks about suffering and dying, and they're talking about who's the most important. But, you know, James and John will come again with another one. I guess they're trying to get past Peter. Somebody else there? I thought they were saying, oh, Tim. Uh, did I understand you say that uh, in addition to Thomas, who wanted to put his hand, put his hand in the, 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 the scar. But yeah, after, he, right, remember that Jesus appeared to the, those who were gathered, but Thomas was not there on, on Easter Sunday, Sunday afternoon, I believe it was, maybe early evening, and Jesus said, see my hands and my side, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the implication is that they saw that, and it doesn't say, and they put their fingers through and all doesn't specifically state that, but it implies it. And remember, Thomas then said, unless I see, unless I put my hands in and see, I will not believe. And then the next week, Jesus puts his words back. Oh, I think it's word for word what he had said. You know, and, and it does not, the implication to me, this is just me, okay, you can choose. It doesn't say he then put his hands in. I think he just said, I believe instead of actually having to do that. Mm -hmm. He didn't ask, this is the thing that's always astounding to me, Thomas didn't ask for anything that the other disciples had been given the opportunity to do. So, uh, and the word is not doubting, technically it is disbelieving, it is believe with an alpha in front, which in my opinion makes it disbelieving. You know, I can't, it's just, I don't know, it's just interesting. So we give him a hard time, and part of my job in ministry, my name, I do not have Thomas as part of my name, is to still try to make it so that you see that he's believing Thomas, because, and he has a couple of interesting places in it. Tim, another follow-up. Yes. Um, knowing that uh, Jesus all along was going to make Peter head of the church, had he ever made that statement to the other disciples, thinking about the pecking order? Well, the, the only specific thing he talks about, Peter, with regards to that, would be uh, the confession at Caesarea Philippi. You are Peter, and upon this I will build my church. And then the argument is, is it the person of Peter, or is it the statement that he made, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God? So that's the argument that's made. Uh, Roman Catholics have a different understanding of that than many other Christian denominations. I mean, you can go through and because they say that Peter is the first pope, uh, that Jesus there had given him, you know, I give to you the keys of the kingdom. However, you see elsewhere that the keys are given to the entire, all the other disciples as well. So it's not just Peter alone who has it. So that is a distinction, and that's a, one of the points of theology that theologians argue about. So you'd like to go for your doctoral dissertation, that'd be a good one to do it on. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, you know, that's that is it's uh, it's one that has been covered a lot, and it will be continued to cover a lot until we get to eternity. Um, I should have brought it; I didn't bring it. Uh, 
Michael Card has a book. If you want to read an interesting book, it's, I believe it's called Fragile Stone. You have to look up Michael Card. It's about stone. It's about Peter. Because he says in the book that Peter is Jesus' best friend. And that really the New Testament, the Gospels are about Peter and Jesus. The other disciples are there, but you hear very little about any of them except for Peter is the one. If anyone's going to talk, it's going to be Peter pretty much, right? I'm going to disprove that as we move to the next section, but most of the time it's Peter. And then you have James and John, but after that we don't hear much specifically about any of the other disciples. Thomas pops up two times that I can think of. One we just mentioned and the other time uh, in John 14 where they're going to go, uh, not for, you know, going to go, where Jesus says, he's, you know, uh, in my Father's house are many rooms, I'm going to prepare a place for you, you know the way I'm going. And Thomas is the one who asks, Lord, we don't know the way, how do we know? And that's when Jesus says, chapter 14, verse 6, I'm the way, uh, truth, and life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Besides that, you don't hear much about Thomas either, about really about any of them. So, it's an interesting point. Like I said, Card has written a whole book about that. It goes through all the instances of interactions between, and it's a worthwhile read when you have spare time, which all of us don't have, but it's worth reading as well. Okay, jumping on. See, I just said, oh, Tim's got a third. This is your last one, Tim, yes, number three. You know, we don't know. Uh, in case I don't get around to do my job of dissertation, <laughs> in 83, I'm going to get to heaven before I get to doctor of dissertation. Did I ever tell you I read a dissertation once? I went to Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. I have a decent library. I think they've redone it now. I mean, I'm an ancient graduate from there now. And uh, I was down in the lower level once, and they have copies of all the dissertations. And I was looking for something to support some article I had to write or something. And I found one. And I'm not making this up. It was a, I think it was a master's level dissertation on the use of the word the in the New Testament. Mm. Uh, it can be important. There's at least one case where the word, use of the word the or its lack is. Do you know the most important place where the word the does not occur when we put the in the text? It's in... Uh, there's a centurion at the cross. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what he says? Truly, this was the Son of God. You can look it up. Do you know the word the does not occur in the Greek text? Mm -hmm. Truly, this was Son of God. And so there is a theologian who's gone through every use of that situation and said the the is assumed. It's interesting. So you think the word the isn't important? It can be very, very important. But we're getting real, really off track now. We'll go on. Ah, in his name. This is verse 38. John said to him, so I just had said, it's always Peter talking. This is an interesting time. It's the only time in Mark's gospel that he calls attention to John alone like this. You know, it's interesting. So it, it's unique. That's why. Teacher, we. But of course, John is using plural forms, right? It's we. Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. You know, it's not, he's not one of us, so tell him to stop. Driving out, ek balo, to drive out, to force or go away out. In your name, he's kind of acting like he's one of us. In your name talks about authority. How important is authority? It's the point that the scribes and the Pharisees seem to continue to bring up against Jesus. Uh, I'll go to the one that pops to mind real fast. When Jesus cleared the temple, what was the problem? Do you remember that? In John's Gospel, he goes and clears the temple. Uh, I'm talking about the time when he goes in after the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. And the question asked is not, why did you do this? But who gave you the authority to do this? By what authority are you doing this? And then it always seems to be the question about, by what authority are you doing whatever? And so the question comes again and again. This fellow is using Jesus' authority, if you will, and he's not one of us. 
And isn't that just for us? That seems to be very exclusionary. That to me seems to be behind the teacher. We saw someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. That the point we tried to stop him is interesting because it implies, at least to me, that they didn't get him stopped, that he kept doing it. How does Jesus respond to that? This fellow is not part of their group, but he's using Jesus' authority to cast out demons. Is that okay? Does Jesus tell him to stop? No, Jesus says the exact opposite, 39. Don't stop him, said Jesus, because there is no one who can perform a miracle in my name who can soon afterwards speak evil of me. For whoever is not against us is for us. And whoever is not, and whoever gives you a cup of cold water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, truly I tell you, he will never lose his reward. I gave that last verse in a different way. For whoever gives a drink, gives to drink you a cup of water because you belong to Christ, amen, I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. I did that more actually in the Greek form there, so it doesn't read quite as well, but it's interesting that truly I tell you, remember we talked about amen, ego, lego, amen, that one right there. This is one of those times so when Jesus is saying that, you better pay attention because what he's talking about is very, very important. A miracle. Miracle is dunamis. Dunamis is our English word of dynamite, or at least that's where we get it from. So what's dynamite like? When you think of dynamite, what is it? Kind of an explosive power or something? Yeah. And so this is the power. So when you see power or miracle, I want to emphasize the greatness of the power. That's what the little point of 39 says. A miracle especially understood as a manifestation of great power. So it's not just boom, but it's boom. I mean, it's something big. It's not just a little thing. And it's done in my name, in Jesus' authority. He can't, if someone's doing that, they're not going to be able to speak evil about that person. No, that's not what is going to happen. Uh, speak evil. Kakolokeo. Kakolokeo. To speak evil of, to revile. So that person will not do such things. Whoever is not against us, for us. The is, is not in Greek, it's just assume. Whoever gives you a cup of cold water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, truly I tell you, he will never lose his reward. So this fellow, although he wasn't part of the group, he really was a follower of Jesus, wasn't he? There's something about that that he had. He, the power of the authority could only come from someone who's going to believe in Jesus and what he did. So I mean, it's all about it's all about authority. And it, who is this guy to do this? And it's instead, it's uh, someone who uh, has that authority. I'm sorry, so I guess I'm using that word too much right now. But someone who's following along, he may not be part of that group specifically, but somehow he has something, some type of relationship, faith relationship with Jesus. He believes in Jesus. Jesus has that power and he's using what Jesus has, not on his own. Probably going over that too much. How about a, uh, in a hot climate? Uh, if you've been to Israel, is it hot? Yes. Very hot. Can you imagine? Wouldn't you like a... I will go back to part of my story. Oh, this is a fun one. Uh, I remember when I was growing up, we would go and pick strawberries for money. And I uh, grew up in Salem, Oregon. Uh, you used to think of Oregon with lots of rain, and that's true at this time of year. But in the summer, it got very dry where I live, and it got very hot. Not humid, though, right? I didn't learn about humidity personally until I moved to St. Louis. Then I learned that I didn't like humidity. But it was humid in the winter, but it, you didn't feel it as much. Unless you came from a D Dakota's, Doug. People who came, moved out from the Dakotas, complained about it because the winter, it went, the cold went right to their bones because of the humidity. And then I didn't learn about that until I went to the Dakotas in the winter where there's no humidity. Is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Very, very low humidity. Not except like... In the, in, except in the summer. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, right, in the wintertime. Yeah. 
So it's interesting. So we're out there and it's 100 degrees and you're perspiring. So I can understand this. It's extra hot. If somebody gave you a, cold, a cup of cold water, I mean, they had a place where we could get water out, but it was warm. Those were back in the days when soda cans, remember when soda cans did not have pop-ups and you had to use the, the opener thing? We loved those because we would take the soda can, put it in the freezer overnight, and it would be freeze solid. And then by the time we were going to eat, it was mostly thawed with some nice little ice inside. What happens if you do it with one of these type of cans? It's gonna blow, you can't do it anymore. It's too sad, too sad. You should go back to the way it was. Anyway, so I understand that. Can you understand that? Think of that. Someone who gives you a cup of cold water, but notice again how it's done. It's done in Jesus' name, by his authority. And if you do that because you belong to Christ, if that's why they're doing it for you, they won't lose their reward. It's a wonderful thought of how this could continue on. But he goes on. He goes on from that to talk about, you know, of course we have to go on from that, I guess. Talk about warnings. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Apparently there are two types of millstones. I will call them the portable hand millstone and the big millstone. The hand one is something that you could use to turn it yourself. And uh, if you look at what it talks about over on the right side of that page where it says a heavy millstone, I'm looking at the third block over there. There's two words that make it. And if you, just, if you use the words uh, themselves, it would be a donkey millstone. That's technically what it's talking about, a donkey millstone. Why a donkey millstone? Well, a donkey millstone is going to be big, probably as big as one of, at least as big as one of these circular tables here. It's going to be thicker than this, but it's called a donkey millstone because it's a big one that you would need an animal to help turn. Well, actually, there were two, I guess, right? You have to have two of them. So it's a big, this is talking about a big millstone. Now, where would he come up with this? There are actually, that is back in, uh, where did I write that down? In, uh, oh, it's not going to say that. I guess it is referred to in Acts 5.37. Uh, the disciples could have heard the punishment that the Romans did in Galilee on some of the leaders of an insurrection under an early zealot leader, Judas the Galilean, where they actually literally tied a millstone around somebody's neck and threw him into the sea. What happens if I put a millstone like that around? If I put a millstone as big as one of these tables that's <laughs> as thick as that, made out of stone, where are you going? You're going down, right? You're not coming up. You're not a pleasant thing to think about at all. Not pleasant at all. Uh, so this is what he's talking about. It's better that that happened to you and that you're thrown into the sea then you cause one of these little ones. Well, what are the little ones? People talk about that in many different ways. <clears throat> we talked about little ones just before. Uh, some would suggest that it's the child that was brought before. Interesting, some suggest that since they were in Capernaum, they were probably at Peter's house because that's where they hung out at Capernaum, and it could have been Peter's child that was brought before them because he did have a couple of kids. Could have been that. Uh, could, it could be that child. It could be that Jesus re is referring to those like the disciples who have a little faith. I mean, they're trying to grow faith, but it's looked at in different possibilities. But I think we often talk about, you know, that we who have faith, if we do something to cause someone whose faith is less, it might be that as well. But Jesus' point is that those, you know, don't do these things that cause a believer to fall away. It's better, you know, to fall away from him, to, to, to destroy their faith. That's not what he wants. And it kind of, he then takes it further with something that doesn't directly follow after it. I mean, in the text it does, but it doesn't directly follow, but it kind of goes even farther away. And if your hand causes you to fall away, it seems like the fall away is the way that we're putting this together. Cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell the unquenchable fire. 
uh, again, causes you to fall away, to go away from. Uh, that word is, didn't talk about that one, skanda, skandalezo, skandalezo, to cause to sin, to cause into anger, to cause to go away. Um, it's better that you cut off whatever causes that. I mean, he'll go on from there in the next verse. I guess I have to turn to the next page. And if your foot causes you, same thing, to fall away, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to fall away, gouge it out. Is Jesus telling you to literally do these things? Yeah. I've uh, read people who don't like the Bible and who say this is all a bunch of things. Why, you know, why would you listen to somebody who's telling you to cut off your hand, cut off your foot, pull your eye out type thing? This, this is hyperbole, right? Jesus is saying it's better than this happen. Don't be like that. Uh, I wanted to talk about in verse 43 two different things. Life. Life is an interesting word there. It is the word, sorry, I got a couple of extra ones there. It is Zoe. So if you know somebody by the name of Zoe, Zoe, I guess technically Zoe, could it, no, it's Zoe. No, it's Zoe. It's pronounced that way, sorry. Uh, it's talking about not just life here, but to enter. It's talking about life eternal type thing, that type of life fullness, you know, all of it. And then he goes on to talk about hell, uh, which is Gehenna. Gehenna. Uh, there's a little point under that little block, under 43, Gehenna Valley of Hinnom. If you know Jerusalem, it's on a kind of a little plateau, and there's a valley behind, right? Uh, you have to go back in Old Testament times, actually, to people before uh, the Israelites lived there, before David took it over. Down in that area was where they, they worshipped their one false god that would cause... I can't think of the name. I didn't write it down. Hmm. But this god, it's not Baal. No. No. Sorry, I'll look it up later, and I'll tell you next week. Sorry, I forgot that. But there's a golden statue with an arm stretched out like this. And what they would do is have a fire underneath that, those outstretched arms. And what you would do is pass your child through the fire. Your firstborn child would be male child, I think it was primarily, maybe it was any one, would be placed on this and left there. What's going to happen to that child? child is not going to live. Can you imagine this crying and screaming that this child would make if you have this, these golden arms outstretched over this fire and it's so hot and everything? And this is part of the sacrificial system that the people who lived there before the Israelites took over with David, but what they did. And so this is down uh, south of the city, kind of south and west, I guess, and that is the Valley of Hinnom. And it became for the Jewish people, a garbage dump, where there is fire all the time. Kind of, we're not going to use that space because how it had been used for such a detestable practice. And so that's where this whole thing about fire emphasis for hell comes forth from this unquenchable fire. And it's interesting that the word unquenchable is asbestos. We used asbestos oh, right. until it became something we go, oh, there are problems with asbestos, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting how that's used, a fire which is in, in, inextinguishable. And so it's better that this happen, you lose that hand, than you end up in this place. You know, you think you're maimed for life, if you will, and you end up in this place, which is a terrible place of suffering. Um, he carries that theme on in verse 45. If your foot causes you to fall away, cut it off. Enter life lame, kolos, interesting, crippled, disabled in feet. Uh, and then there's, uh, if you look, I put verse 46 in there for you. It's probably not in your Bible, or if it's in your Bible, it's in a footnote. It is uh, to have two feet and be thrown into hell where a worm does not die and where the fire is not quenched. So that's actually not in thought to be in the text. It's in some manuscripts, but not in many. Uh, I was looking at... Uh, it's interesting to see 25 goes right over 47. Yeah. They have I'm sorry? Bracketed. Yep, okay. Bracketed, yeah. it's, it's where it's not 
Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, they don't even put it in the commentary. It's in this one. No. See, only, it's only Matthew. Yeah, Matthew is the only one that has says He does not have that either. Oh, just double check and see if Matthew did that. He did not. Um, that means that it is in some manuscripts, but not the oldest, and therefore considered most reliable manuscripts. So I don't know when that change was done. So if you have King James Version, it's going to be in there, but if on a newer translation, it will not. Doug? Is the there were the particular, uh, is it their remorse? Is it, is it someone's demon? Um, so to speak, is it is it is that what the worm is? Um, and the, the whole fire thing is that was from Moloch, right? The worship of yeah, it's Moloch. Thank Moloch. you. Yeah, Moloch. Um, we were just talking about that this morning. Uh, you were talking about yeah, Moloch, Moloch this morning. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, yeah, the interesting context. conversations. In a different context, though. Yeah. In a different context about the, about about the uh, the abortion law, oh. and and how that owes lineage uh, to Moloch. And a lot of people don't really talk about that overtly, but uh, anyway, uh, so so the worms here are those particular uh, the things specific to one's own remorse that cannot be quenched because they're so overbearing. Is that is that a, an accurate uh, sense? Does that reflect an accurate uh, understanding, perhaps, of what worm might be, what one's worm is? When I looked up worm. All it did for me is basically say it was a worm, a larva <laughs> type thing. It did not go, the places I looked, at least, I have not, did not find, you know, that there was a deeper, there, okay. there could be, okay, but, you know, I, I don't know specifically. Um, I didn't see that, but I'm not saying it's not there. Okay. So when you're talking about Molech next time, you can talk about the worm and look at that. could be your doctoral dissertation. <laughs> the use of the word worm in the, I mean, you know, that, that, there could be a great deep meaning there. Yeah. I didn't see that one. Sorry. But I think the emphasis, huh, where their worm does not die and fire is not quenched. A worm would die if you throw it into a fire. <coughs> My granddaughter is into critters now and oh my goodness so she found a little slug and so she named it wormy and so she had wormy for a while she knew where wormy was for she was out playing and then wormy was gone what happened to wormy i don't know so when i see worm i'm sorry that's my context right now because that's what the granddaughter was doing with that if your eye causes you to fall away, gouge it out. Better with one eye than be thrown into hell. Again, there we have worm does not die and fire is not quenched. So that is in that location. Um, the thought is that there was a, that, that, that someone wanted the parallelism and put it above, but I don't know. That's why it did not, why verse 46 is no longer there. But he goes on to talk with salt. What is the use of salt in that culture? Preserver. Salt is a preservative, you know, and if it loses that, if it loses its ability, uh, you know, it also, I mean, it's flavor too, right? Do you put salt on food or do you do not put salt on food? Do you watch how much salt you put on? It was also used in the, in the worship service of the Hebrews. In, in Hebrew service, in, in Old Testament, salt was part of a sacrificial system. So it is part of, of their history, and it would be very familiar to these disciples still at this point. Uh, probably to the people in Rome to whom he's writing, uh, probably less, less. For everyone will be salted with fire. Now 49, let me double check, I got, I got Zoom password. 49, if I remember right, and we find that, 41, does not occur elsewhere in the other references. That is unique in Mark. And 
the thought that's usually expressed is because fire is going to be used against Roman Christians. And so it would be a reference that would they would think, well, that's happened to us. We have been salted with fire. Salt is good, but the salt should lose its flavor. How can you season it? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. I've lost my thing. I have another one. It's the second I've got lost. Too many pieces of paper. Huh. I had more verses. Where did they go? Excuse me. Salt is good, but if the salt should lose its flavor, how can you season it? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. Um, wonder, how does that fit with what he was talking about at the beginning? It seems to have gone a great deal and a great distance. If it should lose its flavor, it should lose its saltiness, lose its flavor, it is analos to be without salt, to be unsalty. If it should be unsalty, how can you season it? In this commentary, it says, when we lose the desire to salt the earth with the love and message of God, we become useless. Okay. So have salt among yourselves. It's interesting how it then becomes something that you have and to be at peace with one another. Interesting how it goes that direction. Yeah. So if you were to go and leave this place, what is the most important thing that you think has been, that Jesus talked about? What's important that you could apply to your life? Doug, I believe, has his hand up. Sacrifice. Okay. Service. I would probably say service. Judy? Love, which is mutually motivates service and, you know, teaching a different path. Love, which motivates service? Okay. Uh, going back to um, 39, where Jesus says, don't stop him because people perform a miracle on me. Doesn't that kind of, that we should all be one in Christ, not necessarily all the denominations and things? I mean, if we're in his name, isn't that the baseline? Versus being broken off into so I'll segments of groups of people? Or how would you still, that someone said, I'm in his name, but then they're doing outrageous things? I mean, I think trying to figure that out. someone is doing something in Jesus name and using his authority that's the context he's saying let them continue to do that so isn't that what we're all trying to do in spreading the word if we're in Christ that we don't necessarily be in, need to be in denominations I am not sure that denominations are a thing of God how about that well, he wants us that. to be one and such. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, then if we get into that farther, then you're going to say, but what do we, where do you draw a line? And I mean, then it, get, it gets messy so fast. Uh, you know, we're a day after Reformation Day, and Reformation <laughs> Day was not to completely change church. What, right. what Calvin did is more, his Reformation was more that. But Luther wanted to correct the major errors he saw in church. He well, did not want to have a separate denomination, and he especially 
did not want the nomination called after him, especially so. And if you follow from Luther when he introduced that and didn't want that, he was just trying to bring up some things that we shall talk. But as the years went on, and then the other folks came in, and then it became political, and then it became warlike, and then it became, um, you know, I mean, it, it deteriorated. So Well, I, I think you went way too fast there. I think Luther himself did not want, it's true, he wanted to reform the church. However, the church in its officialdom did not wish to be reformed. And so that's why something happened then. And then after that split began, then it goes farther and farther, yes, and other people have different ideas. And then you can see, you can read, I guess you can't see since they didn't have cameras there and all, but you can see today they would, everyone would be shooting video with their phones and stuff. But you could read about uh, churches being burnt because, uh, you know, and going in and removing statues and everything, stained glass windows, anything that was too Roman and such. So there was a movement to go way far. Anytime something like this happens, it kind of like as a pendulum and slot swings. And when it starts, it seems that it will gain that power and energy and go. Yes, Sarah, I'm sorry. I didn't need to, I had to finish that one off. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, um, so back in verse 49, um, for everyone will be salted with fire. I think of that more as like um, the Holy Spirit descending on like the disciples or everyone giving the Holy Spirit within them and then moving on. Um, but if the salt should lose its flavor, how can you see that? So if we lose the Holy Spirit, like no longer being able to pass on the scripture or, if, or, or going back to verse. Uh, 43, if you can tell me to to follow the right side up or like follow the right side is kind of how I read that, but I'm not really sure if that's um, if that's what it is to be meant or um, I don't know. I just think of like the fire above the heads of the disciples. Well, let me read to you from Lane. This is what Lane says about that. Lane's pretty good. This brief logion, this brief saying, which is preserved by Mark alone, speaks of a different kind of fire, the fire of purification. This is verse 49. Mm -hmm. While verse 48 applies to the rejected, verse 49 has reference to those who are true to God in a hostile world. The thought of the sacrifice of an offending member of the body, that's in 43 to 47, is here carried a step further. Every disciple is to be a sacrifice for God. Uh, in the Old Testament, temple sacrifices had to be accomplished by salt, accompanied by salt, excuse me. The salt sacrifice metaphor is appropriate to, to a situation of suffering and trial in which the principle of sacrifice cultivated with respect to individual members of the body is now severely tested. The disciples must be seasoned with salt like the sacrifice. This will take place through fiery trials through which God will purge away everything contrary to his will. If you want more on fiery trials, you go to 1 Peter 1, 7 and 4, 12. Understood in this way, Jesus' word is a challenging pronouncement on suffering, which would shed light on the experience of the church in Nero's Rome. Its preservation in the teaching manual of a community facing persecution is fully understandable. And so Lane suggests the reason it's only in Mark's gospel is because of the context in which it was written. You guys are suffering this you're giving up as a sacrifice and fits in with what Doug was saying before. So yeah, it all kind of fits together. Service, sacrifice. And the, my uh, friend asked. Who was the author? Lane? L-A-N-E? Yeah, Lane, L-A-N-E. And uh, we have come past our time. We need to close it up and move to next activities. Some of us have another service to go to, or some of us have a first service to go to. So we'll close with a short prayer. Gracious Lord, help us to learn to be servants and to see our lives as sacrifices to you. Help us not to be concerned about the first place, but to learn to be the servant of all, and in so doing, model your life and the life you called your disciples toward. We ask this in Jesus' most precious name.
Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen. Amen.